one application of what we've been talking about is artificial gravity, in quotes. The lack of gravity is a considerable hazard in long-term missions in space. The human body depends on a gravitational gradient from head to toe, and without it, various gender effects set in. Although we don't know how to generate gravity, true gravity, one proposal to mimic its effects would be to spin spaceships. The normal force required to move the astronaut in a circle would create the appearance of gravity. So we have an astronaut standing in a space station that, fixed at a f that rotates at a fixed rate. At a particular moment, she lets go of the ball at chest height. So she's holding the ball here, and now she's going to let it go. And what happens, of course, is that, which isn't too surprising, because first law says that once she lets go of the ball, there are no forces on it, so it continues at the velocity it had while going around the space station, which we can compute, remember, as V equals mega R. Right. But how, what's going on here looks very different to, to, to people who are inside the space station, like the astronaut, or people outside who are watching it. So if you sort of imagine that we have aliens out here observing her, then while she's in, well, her reference frame is non-inertial because it's rotating, it has an acceleration. Their reference frame is inertial. And so what they see is what we're seeing here, which is she lets go of the ball and it just goes on in a, in a line at a constant rate. But it's very different from her viewpoint. Her brain doesn't really believe that she's accelerating. Our brains never do. And so she sees something different. In the inertial frame, the ball simply continues at the same velocity, traveling in a straight line in the same, at the same speed, and this lands here. But from her point of view, she's not accelerating. She's not rotating. Instead, she sees the ball fall at her feet. It starts here and ends here, and she says this must be the direction of the force on it. Of course, she doesn't see all these dots because, remember, for each of these dots, she's right above it. Like, her head is tracking out this circle as well. Well, it's a terrible circle, but something like that. And so she's always seeing the ball directly below her, like that. They have two different viewpoints. Which one's right? Well, that's not a thing physics can answer very well, but we do know that we can apply Newtonian physics correctly in the inertial reference frames, and things will be weird in non-inertial reference frames. From the point of the astronaut, she suffers no acceleration. She feels a force against her feet. There must be some force pushing her down into the ground, right? Uh, and so the net force in the y direction is this normal force from the, the wall pushing on her minus the weight of the ball pulling down. From the second law, of course, the net force is ma, but she thinks that she's not accelerating, so it's zero. And therefore, she thinks that mg is fn. I'm putting the g here in quotes because this is not g of 9.8 meters per second square on Earth, but rather the uh, free fall acceleration she would measure, the, way she, the weight that she would feel. This is what her scale would read. And she'd say, well, if I read my scale and I divided by my mass, I would get what g would have to be. But the aliens outside are in an inertial reference frame. So for them, there's an acceleration towards the center. She's going around a circle, and we know that anything going in a circle has an acceleration towards the center, which whose magnitude is v squared over r, or as we showed before, omega squared r. So we set up that the net force is now just the normal force against her feet. And the net force is m times the acceleration, which in this case is the centripetal acceleration, so m omega square r. And therefore, the normal force is m omega squared r. And then we follow on one of the sillier sounding rules, the reflexive property in algebra, which is that the normal force equals itself. It's the same, that's the same physical force, same interaction between her feet and the plate of the deck, so we can say that Fn equals Fn, so mg equals m omega squared r, so this fake g has to be omega squared r, and then remember that omega squared r itself is 2 pi over t squared times r, or 4 pi squared over t squared times r. The key thing is that everything on the space station has the same omega, or has the same t, and therefore gravity depends only on your distance from the axis, and we could compute if we know how long it takes to go around once, or equivalently we knew what its angular velocity was, we could figure out what force of gravity she would seem to feel. Some implications. The space station can have different gravity levels by having different actual levels, because this 
quasi g is omega squared r. So that as we increase distance from the center, we also increase the effective gravity, the weight that you feel. Or putting it the other way, as we head towards the center, gravity gets weaker. And that has some implications we'll see in a minute. All right, simple calculation. Let's say the space station has a radius of about 8 meters, that's two and a half stories, and takes about 22 seconds to rotate once. I have a reason for picking those particular numbers, which we'll get to in a slide or two. What effective gravity would the astronaut feel? And we say, well, g effective is 4 pi squared over 22 quantity squared times 8 meters, which turns out to be 0.65 meters per second squared, or about 0.066 g. So this is definitely weak gravity. It's much weaker than even on the moon, which is 0.16. It's about a third of that. And it's about, what is that, a 16th of that on Earth, something like that. All right, the astronaut feels about only 7% as heavy on the Earth. By the way, that's pretty close to weightlessness, but not weightless. So things would settle to the floor, and most likely your biological systems would be fooled into operating correctly. There would still be a, temp uh, a pressure gradient from your head to your feet, even though it's a relatively weak one. And I don't know the numbers. I'm not sure that NASA knows the numbers as to how strong that field has to be for it to... Uh, be equivalent to Earth gravity, so this might be too little, but we're probably sh we could probably easily get to moon gravity, not too hard. If we wanted to get to Earth gravity, we would reverse this, of course, and we would say that we'd set g to be 9.8 and see what t has to be, and we'd find that the period is about 5.6 seconds, um, considerably uh, faster. In fact, just about four times faster, which is not surprising because since this is kind of a 16th but we have a t squared, we get the factor of about 4. All right, this is an alternate version. Apparently, the next three slides, which refer to the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, triggered YouTube's copyright content uh, flag, and it won't show as a YouTube video. This is uh, illegitimate, technically, because these are, in fact, fair use. This is exactly what fair use is meant to be, where you take, credit, you take a film and you critique it and you edit it, um, but YouTube's filters are, well, not the smartest in the world all the time, and so it will not let it go through. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these three videos and put them on Canvas under this video, and then what you should do as the next thing, as they keep popping up, you should go and, well, I'm sorry, should, you can go and play that video. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get my sound commentary, but it won't make a lot of sense because it won't be synced to those videos. Um, this is not the best workaround, but it is the only one I can really think of on short order. One of the places you can see this in pop culture, for certain values of the word pop, was in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is a film by Stanley Kubrick based on a story by Arthur C. Clarke, because at one point uh, Stanley Kubrick said to Arthur C. Clarke, I want to make a good science fiction movie that's interesting and yet scientifically valid. Um, to the extent to which he succeeded is open to some debate, but it is pretty uh, intense, and the science in it is pretty decent, at least up until the end. So here we have um, a spaceship that's going to be coming into oops, uh, docking at a space okay. station that's been rotating. Okay, start the video now. Also, Space Odyssey made it de rigueur for science fiction to use classical music. So here we have a space plane, and it's on approach to this space station, which is spinning so as to give gravity to the people on it. And we can see that what they end up doing is coming into dock on the axis, because on the axis, the speeds are the least. So they can just spin around their own axis match the rotation of the space station. Otherwise, they have to fly along the edge, which is hard. So it's a little hard to see, but out here somewhere is the space plane. So now we're looking inside the dock. You might also recognize this as the landing dock on the Death Star, which was deliberately chosen to look like it. Here's our space plane coming in. And it's doing what looked to be these odd maneuvers, but that's because the space station is rotating. On the Death Star, of course, this was just an empty pit. But here, uh, Kubrick has overlaid people to make it look more realistic. 
and you can see them upside down because gravity is zero right at the center of this point. You can also see now the space plane has under started undergoing its own rotation to match the rotation rate of the space station. As a different aside, these are not really computer displays because in 1968 they didn't have computer displays. So they mocked up graphics and put them on a TV. All right, and memory of Stanley Kubrick. A later scene is set on the space sta spaceship Discovery on its way to Jupiter, which is an 18-month trip, according to technologies that they're using here, uh, which would have been lo too long for astronauts to just be in free fall. It would possibly lead to uh, muscle degeneration. We've seen after a year of somebody in orbit that it can be pretty significant. And in 1968, they really thought that it might be fatal. So uh, they assumed that there would be some sort of rotating section that would give you gravity on the space station and on the spaceship and that's this uh, whoops sorry this section is the habitation section this is the powerful nuclear reactor that's uh, keeping everything running this is mostly maintenance stuff designed mostly to put the habitation thing far away from the hard to shield nuclear power plant uh, if you watch the movie this is the antenna that later on has tremendous plot impact but we don't care about right now in the habitation section this is spinning um, in and out of the page, actually, this is the axis of rotation so that the astronauts can seem to have gravity. And that's what we'll see next. Okay, start the second video now, and it should play along with this. So here we have David Bowman, and actually, it's Frank Poole, sorry. And he's running around the habitation ring so as to stay in shape. He's just jogging a little bit. And the idea is that it's rotating about this axis, but from his viewpoint, it seems to not be rotating. Instead, he seems to see gravity. They'll cut to his viewpoint in just a second. All right, from his viewpoint, the thing rolls around but he always feels an outward force, which he thinks is a downward force that the deck plate pushes against. You can also see the three astronauts in cryosleep and the two cryosleep things for the two astronauts who are awake. He's run around pretty fast. <laughs> He's now running the other way, actually. This is the computer Hal's eye looking at the other astronaut who's awake coming through the hub. And in the hub, that astronaut is essentially weightless as he comes from the back of the ship. And then what he does is he comes out, uh, there we go, and climbs down a ladder. So he has basically no weight, no weight here, and now he's climbing down a weight ladder getting stronger and stronger weight. And then from his viewpoint, now he's on it, the floor. Kubrick was a good director and clever. You never see both Bowman and uh, the other guy in frame at the same time, so you don't have to worry about, like, how come one of them doesn't fall? And then they stop it rotating. So people stop getting kind of thrown off. And they say, hey, now we just film. So one joy of the internet is that before you waste your time, somebody out there has probably wasted their time for you. Somebody out there, a film student, uh, worked out what you had to do so as to get this to work because, of course, what they had to really do was spin the set. And so this is going to be a match-for-match match of this special effects shot where they reconstruct what it must have looked like uh, for real in the inertial reference frame. And, okay, you can start video three now, and it should sync up. So here they are clawing back through that 
low gravity section and they have to swing into the non-rotating part of the ship actually which is where they're going so that they can talk and then Kubrick rotates the camera the other way so it looks like there's now still even though they're in the rotating sp space frame and we know that because they're climbing down where there will be gravity You might notice there's not a lot of dialogue in 2001 A Space Odyssey, although there is some talking back and forth. You might wonder, how did he achieve this, especially in 1968, where there's no CGI, uh, there's no advanced computer control of things, and it's kind of impressive. He basically built a giant fer Ferris wheel set, <laughs> and they spun the set, they literally spun the set under the astronaut who was always standing here, and had to run at the correct speed so as to end up, um, you know, to end up not falling off, <laughs> end up not moving up, but they rotated the scene under him as stuff went on and I think they did something similar for the hallway which I think is back here um, when when they were doing the rotating shots the astronauts were strapped in when Frank Poole is just running around the the uh, the set the entire set is actually spun about him this is part of Kubrick's obsessive de dedication to perfectionism and realism and it supposedly cost about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars but that was in 1968 so today that would be a five and a half million dollars for what comes out to be maybe 30 seconds of footage um, Kubrick was a little bit obsessive but it's kind of nice because we can see how you can mock this thing up even on the earth um, you can make it look right today it'd probably be done mostly in the computer rather than the camera but all right